So let's now use our square root of minus 1, our i, to write down a solution to our differential equation in a slightly different form. Here's our equation of motion, again, relating the second derivative of x to x. We're going to try a solution of this form, x is equal to a e to the i omega t plus phi. So we're using our i here in a complex exponential, which we know is related to sine and cosine functions. So we need to find the second derivative, x double dot, and we substitute x double dot into this side of the equation and x into this side of the equation and find some condition on omega such that we can, we can solve our equation. So making these substitutions, so here's x double dot and, and here's x over here, we see this equation is true provided omega squared is equal to k on m. That's the same condition we had before when we used the cosine function. So if our omega squared is equal to k on m, then omega is equal to, we'll take the positive, root k on m. And we can write x of t is equal to a e to the i root k on m times t plus phi. So there's our solution for x using complex exponential notation. Looks good. There's a problem. One problem is that um, this equation here, this function here rather, can be written out in terms of cos and sine functions like this. And this part over here, the imaginary part, is an oscillating sinusoid. So as a function of t, this equation for x has an oscillating imaginary part. But x is a distance. We think it should be real valued, not some sort of complex number. So there's some sort of strange thing going on here. x must be real because it's a distance, but here we have a function which is complex. What can we do about it? Well, one way to do it, solve this problem, that is, is take our equation of motion and then as a solution we write down a times the real part of e to the i omega t plus phi. So we just look at the real part of this and throw away the imaginary part and we can take the real part all the way through the derivation. The derivation is exactly the same as the one I just showed you except now wrapped around this e to the i omega t plus phi is the real part. So again we have the same condition that omega squared must be equal to k on m. Take the positive root and then we can write x of t is equal to a, the real part of all of this. And the real part of this function is the cosine. So it seems like we haven't really gone anywhere except around in a circle. All we've done is written the cosine function as the real part of all, all of this stuff here. So it's a bit of a strange thing to do. So one way to think about this is it's just a notational trick. We didn't have to write the real part all the way through this derivation. We could just use this e to the omega t here and then at the end, remember that we want the real part and take the real part just at the end. So we can use e to the omega t plus phi as shorthand for the cosine function. It's you know, just a different way of writing the same thing in a way. So as I suge suggested, we can use this as, a, as um, a shorthand for the solution knowing that we just mean the real part of this function. Now, If you find this somehow unsatisfying, there's also another way to see how all of this works. Remember how we always just took the positive root of k on m? Well, we can use the negative root and construct a function which is real valued using the positive and negative roots. So let's have a look at this way of doing things now. Okay, so let's go through all this again for the last time. So here's our setup with the force and with due to the spring and the mass, i is the square root of minus one. This is our equation of motion. And this time our solution, trial solution looks like this. x is equal to b e to the i omega t. So I've changed from a to b here for reasons that will become clear and I've left off phi. We don't need phi when we think about it this way. So as before we need to find the second derivative x double dot so we can put it into this equation here and find a condition on omega squared. Everything looks the same so omega squared must be equal to k on m. So if omega squared is equal to k on m then omega is equal to plus or minus k on m. So this is where the point of difference for jumping so this is where the point of difference comes, is we're going to take omega's plus or minus k on m. In this case, we're going to say that x of t is b times e to the i k on m times t. So this is the part with the positive root, the positive k on m. I'm going to add to that some amount of the negative root. So c times e to the i k on m times t, the negative i times k on m times t. So the solution is going to be some combination of the positive root and the negative root with coefficients b and c. Now if we want to make this a real valued function we just make c, we force c to be equal to b star. So now we have a function here b e to the i 
root k on n times t plus b star e to the negative i root k on n times t, and these two are complex conjugates of each other. Adding two complex conjugates together means that x of t here must be a real valued function. So this is another way of expressing x. Let's show that's the same as same x that we had before, or can be converted into the same x that we've had the previous two iterations of this solution, solving this differential equation. So here's our solution for x. What we're going to do is expand this in terms of its real and imaginary parts, show the imaginary parts cancel out, and see what the real bits left over look like. Look like. So we expand, expand, expand. So we take the real part of b times the cosine minus the imaginary part of b times the sine because the i's multiplied together give a negative term. So here's a real part, an imaginary part, a real part, an imaginary part. We see that on this uh, fourth line here and the second line here, the imaginary terms cancel because there's a negative, a negative, and a positive, and a positive. So these lines cancel and these two add together. So we get all of this is equal to 2 times the real part of b times cos minus 2 times the imaginary part of b times the sine function. Now I'm going to write twice the real part of b as b1, twice the imaginary part of b as b2, and here we have a, a sine minus a cos. And but they're going at the same frequency. And in fact, if you have any two sinusoids, like a sine and a cosine function, with different amplitudes for the same frequency, you can write that as a single sinusoid with a new amplitude and a phase shift. And so I leave it as an exercise to find a and phi, this amplitude and this phase, in terms of b1 and b2, the difference of this cosine and the sine function. And so now what we've done is solve this differential equation in three different ways. Once with a cosine function, once using uh, e to the i omega t plus phi, but then just taking the real part, and once uh, with this function here, we don't include the, the phase initially, but it turns out the phase uh, phi pops out in the difference of these cos and sine functions. All of these ways of writing down the solution are equivalent, um, it's up to you to figure out which one you find the easiest to use, really. It's just a matter of style, and that's it.